So, Max, you know, what was your first interaction with Ben Roethlisberger? You know, it's funny. Uh, the first interaction I had with Ben, we both arrived in the Pittsburgh International Airport together, and we met each other as we were going down the escalator to meet our driver uh, uh. before heading over to the Stan Saverin show. We rode together in the car. Um, and uh, that was the first time I remember, you know, talking to him, introducing myself and he, him introducing himself to me and just getting to know each other. Uh, and it was uh, it was cool. I was like, man, OK, this is going to be my quarterback for the future. I, like we were drafted together. He's the first rounder. So I know he's going to be around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty amazing. You were there from the start, you know, at the in the first draft class with the guy. Yeah, I mean, in the first draft class and then the first time we show up to the south side uh, at the facility, you know, you're looking around, you know, you have those those yellow tags above the lockers to let you know where you are. And I, I remember seeing and it was like, boom, both of us it was like the rookie corner was right over there. And Ben and I were right next to each other. Bo Lacey was a couple of doors down. Um, and that was our first introduction. So how about on the field? I know that was your first introduction, but what's the most memorable moment for you? I mean, I have a guess, but I want to hear you say it. <laughs> yeah, I mean. You, you, there, there's so many moments. I mean, you know, you think of, right, the Santonio San play, because that's just an iconic football history, you know, history of the Super Bowl type of play. But you know what, you, you know, is one of my favorites, you know, is actually, you know, on the field and been just running around forever and then making a big throw. Uh, I remember one he made against uh, against the Ravens to Hines and I'll never forget this this was this was my second year in the league and it was earlier in the season he's scrambling around and he goes left he goes right and you're just like just get rid of the ball right you know you're, you're holding on for dear life I was at right tackle at this time and then he, he leaks out a little bit further to the right and just delivers a dart down the sideline to Hines and, and those type of moments just 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 stick in your head, you know, the moment when uh, when Haloti punched him and broke his nose, right? And him just sitting on the sidelines, blotting it, blotting it. You see, it, it, it's, a, it's a question mark. It's, there's no more exclamation point up and down. I mean, it is a true question mark on his nose. And, he, and he's just like, let, let, let's go, let's go. I need to get back out there. Blood's still coming down the front of his jersey. They're trying to peroxide it off. And it's just, it's indicative because all of these moments kind of flood your mind. You know, the Nick Harper play, right, against the Colts where he runs him down and makes the most unathletic tackle I've seen uh, by a, by a non, by a non-defensive player, but it worked, right? You know, yeah. just like, he just, he always had a way of making it work. The impossible was always possible with Ben and um, you know, countless fourth quarter drives um, got to have it moments. And, and he had them, he, he had to have them too, just as much as we had to have it. He had to have it for himself, you know, coming off the field with an injury, and then coming right back, whether it was wrapped, spatted, or whatever, he would come back in and try and finish a game like an Iron Man. You know, when you see that continually over and over again, you kind of get numb to it. You kind of create a standard, like you expect it from him. And I think even for us in his final year, we expected those excellent moments to happen, and we expected to win every single game that we went into. Um, so it was, uh, so it's just something that I'll always treasure, you know, nine years with him and sitting and sharing a locker next to him. Heck, one of the moments I remember that's probably the most significant to my career was when I was cut and released, he wore my Jersey to practice and was lobbying for me to come back. I mean, that's something that you don't see anybody do, but he did, but he, he did. And I didn't ask him to do it. You know, it was something that he felt he wanted to do. And I was truly appreciative because I enjoyed protecting his blind side and protecting him any way I could um, because he was, he was my friend. He was my classmate. And, you know, you root for that and you root for those type of people. And he's grown a lot. I mean, this dude grew from a boy to a grown man with kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and a beard is more common than uncommon for him. So it, it's really special when you look back on, on the time that, Ben Roethlisberger has given to the city of Pittsburgh. He's given of himself and what he's done on the field. is just truly amazing. I remember him wearing your Jersey. I do remember that. Yeah. I also, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what I remember. And I think what a lot of people remember him as you, you just touched on it right there. When you think about Ben Roethlisberger in his prime, he made stuff happen. He could be running back there for five seconds, 10 seconds, but he needed guys like you to hold those blocks. 
and he's trying to find someone open. And all those fourth quarter comebacks, I don't know if there was another quarterback that might have ever played the game that had that ability, you know, in the prime of his career. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, even for, you know, Tom Brady, who he recently had passed this season, um, you know, it was Tom, Tom's wasn't as stylish. It wasn't as, it didn't have the same flair, right? And I think, yes, is there one brewing? Absolutely. Patrick Mahomes will show you that he's working on those lines. But up until that point, Ben's the blueprint. Ben is the template for how that, that was done. And then over the sustainment of his career, how he's done it. It wasn't like, ah, I had a couple of moments here. He did it throughout, and he created those memorable moments that we all remember as Steeler fans when we think of iconic times either coming to Heinz Field or in our living room watching these games. You know, you're ready to throw the brick and break the TV, and you're like, oh, my God. And then you cheer, and you're crying. You're, you're hugging you're hugging your friends. He created those moments. And, you know, I thought something significant, you know, I heard Charlie Batch talk about is that he created – the fervor that is Steeler Nation now. Yes, we had Steeler fans and we had Steeler fans all around. I mean, from the 70s and on that created a legacy. But when you think about Steelers Nation, how we know it today, it's because of Ben Roethlisberger. Good, bad, or indifferent, it's because of him. You know, I think up until this year, I think everyone had faith if the game was going to close and you give the ball to Ben Roethlisberger, he was going to win you the game. Absolutely. Michael Jordan. Hey, who wants to take the last shot? MJ wants to take the last shot. Hey, we have one, got to have a drive left. I'm giving the ball to Ben Roethlisberger and I'm letting him cook, right? We always talked about, I mean, we talked about this for weeks at the end of the season. Just let Ben go and do his own thing. Give him a no huddle package or, or his own change of pace package. Just let him work. Let him do what he does. We always lobby for it. And maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It didn't seem like it but we'll never know. But that's what, that, that's what you breeded. He breeded that type of trust and confidence in us as fans, as media members, as teammates to say, you know what? I trust this guy and I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to walk through the fire with him. You know, you, you are unique in this situation because you played with them. You were drafted with them. You were a fan. And then now you're a broadcaster and you've seen the end of his career. We were both on the sidelines. We, we saw this un year, this year unfold you know, give me your perspective of this year. For me, it was a little bit different. You could tell that it was the end, even from that first game in Buffalo when he waited out in the field a little bit longer uh, for pregame and then walked off, kind of looking around, taking it all in. Did you notice any of that throughout the season? Yeah, I mean, you know, in hindsight, I look back on it and yeah, there's moments, right? There's moments where you're taking those mental snapshots to remember these moments and, and you'll sit out on the field a little bit longer. You'll sit on the bench a minute, minute longer before it's time to go in. You know, you'll, you'll kind of take a moment and kind of close your eyes and just remember what it is before you run out the tunnel. Um, when you're going into that first huddle of the first drive of the game, you remember the last huddle of the last drive of the game, of that last play. You, you, you take a little bit of pause to kind of take in the moment so that you don't forget it. You take that mental Kodak moment, so to speak. And I, I did notice that, you know, things that he would linger on longer than normal where you just kind of shake it off and just go, you know, you kind of, you kind of sit there and you're like, okay, okay. It's almost like trying to gain that peace. You're searching for moments to create a complete peace puzzle for yourself of what it meant, you know, in your final year of play. As a broadcaster analyst, do you think it was the right time for him to retire? You know, when I look back on it, I think it was. I think it was. I mean, because, you know, one of the things I always tell young guys when they come into this league, because I, I do O-line consulting, you know, I say, listen, guys, when the will to prepare is not as great as the will to not prepare, that's when you know it's time. And when I say that, I'm not saying, oh, he doesn't have a desire or a passion, but when your desires and passions lie elsewhere, right? Because football requires a toll and it's a high toll that you must pay year in and year out in order to be great, in order to sustain your success. Because the older you get, it doesn't become easier, it just becomes more efficient, but the time is still there. And as you get older, there's more time for treatment versus time for you know, weightlifting. <laughs> there's more time in film study than there is on the practice field, but you still have to devote that time. 
And when you look at Ben and his family and Ashley, and you say, you know what? I'm missing moments as my kids are growing up. That sticks in your mind. And you're like, I want to, I, I, you know, I want to be here for those moments. You know, hey, now granted, you'll ask him probably about four months into retirement when he's doing when he's doing the carpool line trying to pick his kids up from school. <laughs> He'd rather be at football practice. He'll probably tell you different. But those are the moments that you don't get normally. And it's more of a luxury when it does happen. Now you want to create that as a norm because you want that normalcy to be something. And you want to be able to grow your family. I mean, that's why you have children, right? To pass on your legacy. But you don't want them to have to take in your legacy the whole time. You want to be able to share it with them and grow with them in those experiences. So I think it was the right time for him. And also, you know, once again, you make those decisions. What did I accomplish? Did I accomplish everything I set out to do? When I when I when I came into football and I think for him outside of winning a third championship, <laughs> I think you could say I went been well done job well done you own the north you, you you won two Super Bowls you went to three of them. And you know you've gone to Pro Bowls you've done it all you've led the league in passing, you have a tremendous record, especially with four quarter to come back drives so. I think that when you look at it, I think he should be satisfied with where he's at after 18 years of play almost two decades. You know, I'm sure he loves the fact that his kids, you know, had a chance to see him play. Last question, I'll let you go. You know, the one play that I think Ben will be remembered for, maybe the, the greatest play uh, that everyone talks about is that throw to Santonio Holmes. And I remember talking to Santonio Holmes just recently about this. And he said, you guys ran that in practice um, about 100 times and you couldn't connect, but you call it in the Super Bowl. So take me through that play, through the huddle. What was the call? And, and just, you know, explain those, that, that, how it all unfolded. So for me as an offensive lineman, I'm going to use the offensive line version of it. It was 52 pro. <laughs> so it was a five man protection. Um, there were, but it was, it was now it was now here's the funny thing. We ran the same exact play to the left side, the play before. So just to give you enough, we already knew what was coming because it was like, okay, we ran 53. Now we're running it as 52 pro and you're running it. And so, there's that deep angle route, which is which is a corner post that that San Antonio was running. Then you have, of course, two shallows coming across to try and take the safeties away from it, so he gets one on one with the corner on outside leverage. And then you have a small hook curl as the as the check down. So you know, for us, we're blocking. I'm on the left side, so I'm technically the farthest guy on the field away from that play at the time being. But you know, we just remember calling it, and I I just remember I was blocking Bertram Barry. And me and B are, are struggling. We're tired as well because, you know, th that was a long March drive that was continuous to get to that point. And we're battling. And the next thing you know, you just hear the crowd erupt. So what my first thing is, I run to Ben to see he has the hands up and, and I grab him. And then afterwards, I look at the replay on the screen and I'm just like, oh, my gosh, it finally worked. <laughs> it finally worked because he'd been throwing it to the outside, trying to get it to where only Santo, you know, only the receiver could get it or nobody was getting it at all. Because that was a third down play. So we still had a, that was a second down play. So we still had two more tries at the end zone. And at that point, I was like, listen, if this play doesn't work this time. We need to just run it twice. We can run it down their throats. I don't care. Let's just run it in this moment. I know we've passed to get down here, but this is too big of a moment. And you look at it and seeing how far out of bounds it was and where San Antonio went to grab that and still keep his feet together uh, was, was something that, you know, it's just, it was special. And that Super Bowl, you know, meant a lot to me because that was the closest I was going to play to home. I'm from Orlando. So I had a lot of family in there. So I'm like, please don't lose this game in front of all of my family crowd. And Ben, Ben delivered. Him and San Antonio you know, I, I kid San Antonio. I said, listen, T Tone, you need to you need to give that pedicure person, whoever did your pedicure uh, this week, give her a bonus. Walk back in there, give her a bonus, because obviously <laughs> she did something with those toes to make you stay on stay in bounds. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, Max. Great stuff. I always appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure, Rich.